The Butcher of Ark, Volume 3, The First Steps. The first days of my journey were an almost spiritual yet not entirely pleasant experience. I felt as if I had lived my whole life wearing a veil over my eyes. The greater the distance to the barren cliff with Fogville became, the more surreal it seemed that I had lived there for 28 years as a priest. It almost felt as if it had been merely a dream. After all, who was I? I was unable to find a satisfying answer to that question. If I did not end my foolish journey and return immediately, I would become a heretic, a pathless one in the eyes of the Holy Order, someone who had strayed from his path. The fact that I belonged to the clergy was of lesser concern to me. When I thought of Malfas and his 101 verses, doubt and bitterness pierced my sense of liberation like a mental sword. Yet the thought of returning sparked a similar reaction. That dull feeling in my stomach lurked inside me. When I tried to take a few steps back towards Fogville on the second day of my journey, the very same terrible panic arose which had led to the breakdown in my chamber. No, the only path for me to take now was the one leading through my suppressed memories, away from my false life. I had not the slightest idea where to start looking for the lost fragments of my childhood. I had only been two years old when Gilmon had found me, what could have happened to shape my life to such an extent? I had only one clue to find answers. The ominous words of the veiled woman. To trust these words was as foolish and irrational as trusting a Quarian bone reader, but I had no choice. Follow the fire. I halted for a moment and wiped the sweat from my forehead. After I had descended from the Fogville cliff, I had followed a narrow path along the coast. I had now reached the border to the heartland. Ark was about 11 days march away, but I intended to use my last pennies to pay a mirrored flight to the capital. The overgrown tracks through the Andrelian forests were too dangerous. Currently I walked on an unpaved road between colourful meadows, a temporary interruption of the forest that surrounded me for most of the route. The sound of birds was in the air and the sun was burning on the back of my neck. You are insane, Jail, simply insane. I thought as I looked back. Indeed, what I did was contradicting everything the holy verses had taught me. Only about seven turns of the moon ago, I, I had accompanied a small group of boys and girls of appropriate age through their consecration. I remembered how a bright red-haired Eterna girl had spoken to me during one of the prepar uh, preparatory lessons. Her hair was fine and straight, like it usually was, for the pointy-eared race. What if I had... What if I would not want to become a tailoress, she asked, had asked me after I explained the importance of their in upcoming names day ceremony to the children. What is your last name, young girl? I had answered smilingly. The determined look had not vanished from her eyes. Silna, father. My name is Silna. Silna, very well. Let me give you a small riddle. Or rather, let me give you all a small riddle. She had furrowed her brows and looked at me sceptically, like, more like a grown woman than a young girl. Picture yourselves as brave explorers. It is your holy mission, personally assigned to you by the Grand Master of the Order, to discover new lands far beyond the Scarag Isles, just as the first pioneers did in Enderal. The blank or bored looks on the children's faces had been replaced by curiosity. Only Sil uh, Silna had continued to regard me with determined scepticism. However, I had said pointedly, raising my index finger, a great disaster happens to you, a thunderstorm. You are only halfway when your gallery is torn apart by a tempest. When your, ga when your gaily is torn apart by a tempest. You are lucky because none of you are hurt, but you find yourself on a wild deserted island. There is nothing but thickets, cold sand and wreckage around you. With the exception of Silna, all of, you, all of them had been drawn into my tail at this point. And um, you all know that if you want to survive, you need to act at once. For not only bitter cold and hunger could be your doom, you can hear a threatening growl from afar, a sound that only a wild vatir could bring forth. When I mentioned the hideous goat-like creatures which usually lived in dark and moist caves, some of the children had uttered noises of disgust. So you start collecting wood and build a camp, but soon you realise that some of you are better qualified for certain tasks than others. Raylof, for example, Raylof, for example, can carry twice as much wood as Silna because of his strong physique. You, Gilna, are a gifted markswoman because your father allowed you to practice with the straw dolls in the guardhouse at an early age. Now, who should keep the first watch and who should look, go looking for firewood? All children had agreed that Raylof was supposed to carry the wood and Gilmer to keep watch. The game had continued until all tasks had been assigned. 
to the pioneers according to their physical and mental conditions. Well, I had continued my tale, but now something bothersome happens. Rayloff feel ex feels exploited and does not want to collect any more firewood. The boy had looked at me indignantly, but I reassured him with the gesture of my hand. Of course he behaves like this only in my story. By all means, he does not want to go looking for firewood anymore. He says he wants to keep watch with Gilmer, even though all of you know that he would not be able to hit a blind, paralysed troll with his bow. Now my question to you is this. What would be best for all of you? If Rayloff came to reason, or if he kept watch from now on and Gilma collected wood instead, the children had voted unanimously for the first choice. Very well, only this way you will be able to defy the tears, hunger and cold on the inhospitable island until a, a galley arrives and brings you safely back to Enderal. This is the essence of what the Holy Scripture teaches us. Unity and strength can only emerge in a community that serves the welfare of all and not just an individual. Malthus himself chooses our divine tasks, for who else knows our strengths and weaknesses better than the one who grants our mothers the gift of fertility each moon? With a satisfied smile, my gaze had wandered back to the one who had initially asked the question, and that, dear Silner, is the answer to your question. Even if you have doubts about the path Malthus is soon to be is soon to, is going to choose for you, defy them as you defy a disease. For only a people united in flesh and mind will be able to prevail eternally. The children's answer had been content silence. Silna, however, had not lost her sceptical expression even after I had finished my story, in which I had been inspired by the first verse of the path. The path. Had I ever believed in it, I did not know. It was what mother. Uh, Pelia had told me it was what I was supposed to believe if even I an educated man with access to so much knowledge was only able to discover the decayed memories of childhood after a vision what about other people do they all live a false life but what if it shot through my mind the path is indeed a lie what what guides us then this heretical thought kept me occupied until the sun set. The sun had disappeared almost entirely behind the horizon by the time I spotted signs of human life on the trail again. Like the four days before, I had been wandering through woods of pines and cypresses, encountering not a single human soul, but now a giant field of wheat stretched out before me, and in the middle of it stood a windmill tall as a tower. Its wheels turned slowly in the evening wind and a mixture of dusty earth, moss and freshly cut grass hung in the air. For a moment the rustic beauty of the sight made me forget my aching legs and the dull feeling in my stomach, people. Despite my fatigue I accelerated my steps and soon reached a paved road which, would wo uh, which wo wound between the hills overgrown with wheat. After a short while... I found what I had been looking for and in. Night had fallen completely by now and the orange light from the windows of the old ivy-covered farmhouse promised shelter and rest. A smile formed on my face and I sighed with relief. The past few nights I had spent in my small caverns, which my back used to be used to my soft bed, did not approve of. A warm meal. Suddenly, two horses dashed past me in a full gallop. Instinctively, I jumped to the side. The flank of one of the horses barely missed me. I let out a scared cry, stumbled as I tried to regain my balance in vain. I landed in the dust with muffled thud. What in blazes? Indignantly, I looked at the riders who came to a halt in front of me. They were both very tall and wore solid leather garments like hunters. Their horses were black, indicating an expensive breed. Angrily, I watched them dismount, tossing a penny to a slender boy who was probably the stable hand and disappear into the tavern. Even back then, I hated inconsiderate and crude people. Had these two apes even realised that they had almost run me down? Probably not. And if they did, they would not even look at you. My lips shrank to a thin line. Damn primitives. But my mind was too exhausted to allow any more angry thoughts. I shrugged in resignation, picked up my staff from the ground and went to the farmhouse. The overwhelming sweet scent of freshly baked bread greeted me and my anger dissolved. One last time I looked at the tavern sign swaying in the wind, the Red Ox. This was where I would spend the first civilised night of my new life. I entered the tavern to a pleasant buzz of voices, clanking goblets and crackling fire. The cold was quickly driven from my limbs, my mouth watered. During my long march, I had only eaten a few pieces of bread and a couple handfuls of whisperweed. The tavern looked well frequented, which explained the empty roads outside. I assumed that it served as the meeting point for the local farmers. There was enough space for about 30 souls here, and nearly every chair, stood and bench was occupied. Torches illuminated the room and cast dancing shadows of the guests on the walls. 
I scanned the crowd. Next to the entrance, a tired-looking man studied a yellow picture book called The Merry Eterna Damsel with great interest. Judging from what I could make out of its saucy images, they had not been drawn exclusively for an ethnologists. A bearded bard tuned his lute on a shamefully tiny pedestal. He was probably preparing for his next song to, de to be devoured by the noise around him. Right in front of me sat an enviably attractive, well-dressed man who was engaged in conversation with a woman whose countenance showed utter devotion. I estimated him to be 35 winters old. His hair was jet black, his face masculine yet delicate with a three-day stubble. My mouth distorted. He has to be a prick from the upper city, one of those who shag around and waste their inheritance. Just as I finished the thought, the bow had noticed me staring. Uh, for a few heartbeats, he looked at me with sparkling eyes and smiled, fetching a narcissistic at the same time. Fetching a narcissistic at the same time. Then he turned back to his admirer. The other guests appeared to be travellers and farmers of all sorts, men and women, young and old, tall and short. I felt misplaced, like a northman on a uh, quarian bazaar, strange and uneasy among the rough people among the rough people among whom I did not belong. Hastily I stepped up to the counter, which was located under a lower part of the ceiling and behind which various li barrels and liquors were lined up. I was about to speak when I noticed the two clumsy figures seated on the high stools, the two apes. Now I had time to study them. One of them had a full beard and two strange earrings, which gave him the appearance of a uh, buchan buccaneer. His chum had no beard, but he did have a chin that looked like it could shatter walls of Northwind stone. I felt the urge to grab the mug in front of me and throw ale into their faces. The idea vanished, however, when the two took notice of me. Unwittingly, I ducked my head while they gave me an amused look before turning their attention back to their stew. They did not even recognise me. With a small nod, I summoned the barmaid who was cleaning mugs behind the counter. She approached, sizing me up with vague curiosity. Matris, what may I get you? At least she had the decency to address me as an urban citizen. I tried not to show my inner turmoil. A glass of goat's milk, please. I tried to sound masculine and confident, but my voice, coarse and untrained after four days of silence, was a pitiful croak. The reactions could not have been more intense had I asked for the crown jewels of the Golden Queen. While the barmaid only smiled and shook her head in sympathy, the, tr the two primitives next to me burst out laughing. Goat's milk? One of them roared, slapping his comrade's shoulder. He wants a glass of goat's milk. I stared at the giant, irritated but defiant. I could probably have avoided the events that followed if I had not responded. Although numerous snappy answers passed through my head, the one that I finally gave them, arms crossed in front of my chest, was pathetic. Yes, goat's milk, I replied with quivering voice. With a quivering voice do you have a problem with it this only appeared to intensify the apes hilarity their new round of laughter was so loud that even the bearded bard stopped playing his lute and as many other guests turned his insulted yet curious gaze towards the counter after they had finished laughing and patting each other's shoulders affirmatively the buccaneer spoke to me by no means mattress he mustered a fainted uh, sympathetic expression a grin already on the verge of breaking through it's just unfortunately the tavern is fresh out of goat's milk maybe you want to try the harlots in in the bathhouse of ark i felt fierce anger arise in me never since i had become a priest had i been treated with such disrespect disrespect never i will do that when i visit you next time in the compound, in the ape's compound. I froze, the snappish retort had come from my mouth faster than I had been thinking and the cheeriness of the two chills dissolved just as quickly. From the corner of my eye, I saw almost half the guests follow the events with apprehension. You damn idiot, you damn miserable idiot. For a moment, the eyes of the buccaneer and his chum narrowed to slits. Then the anger left their faces and was replaced by a livid feistiness. Well, well, he drawled, sounding unmistakably vicious. Sounds like, so you're a real badass. I wanted to take a step back, but the buccaneer grabbed my wrist with his right hand. His grip was hard and firm, his fingers crude and full of calluses. I felt cold sweat breaking out all over my body. I realised that the man was primitive but dangerous. Half-heartedly, I tried to escape his hold, a convulsion the two men ignored easily. I, I am sorry. The gorilla covered my mouth with his hand. He pointedly glanced at his chum, who sneered even more. I like brave people, but you seem to be exhausted from your long journey. The other man pushed something towards him over the counter. So how about a little refreshment? 
With that, he released my mouth, grabbed the bowl and poured its contents over my head. It was stew and if the encounter had occurred a few minutes earlier, the broth would probably have sc scalded my skin. Nevertheless, I was covered in hot, sticky slime. Shocked, I gasped for air, inadvertently inhaling some of the broth. I broke down coughing and panting. The meaty brew dripped down my hair and some of it found its way into my garment, running down my spine. I heard roaring laughter around me. I was certain that most of it came from the buccaneer and his chum, but some of those who had watched the events were now laughing as well. My stomach cramped, shame rising within me. There, there I was, degraded, coughing stew, the laughing stock. I felt the impulse to jump up and grab the buccaneer's throat, but my reason suppressed my insanity, suppressed it instantly. I was deeply humiliated, but I had no death wish, so I tried to raise myself up in a controlled and dignified manner and remove pieces of meat from my clothes. Indeed, my indifference and serenity would be enough of a lesson for those two brutes. I gathered all my priest's courage and turned around. They looked at me, amused and challenging. They want me to keep acting defiantly, I thought. They want me to keep provoking them. I did not stand the slightest chance against any of them in close combat, that was certain. After all, I had as much knowledge of brawls as a troll about hair care. <laughs> Just leave jail, leave and swallow your damn pride. I peered at the crowd. Most of the guests had returned to their meals or conversations. Only a few of them still looked at me expectantly. Among them, the black-haired beau. Nobody seemed to despise the Im impudence of the two men at all. Abruptly, I realised what had protected me from events like this my entire life. My priest's robes. It had been the only reason why the other boys had stopped mocking me after my consecration. And it likely was on the only reason why everyone had lowered their heads devoutly, or at least had the decency not to pour stew over me when I entered a tavern. You are a nobody jail. Without your priest robes, you are just another common man, neither big nor slim, neither old nor young, neither ugly nor handsome, meaningless. I briefly considered drawing the priest's brooch, which I had not had the heart to leave behind from my bag. Oh, how they would have looked at me, the primitives. They would have begun to recite the prayer of the path, with eyes widened by fear, asking for my forgiveness. They would respect me, what you represent. Yes, they would bow their head in reverence because they fear the power of the holy order. Of course they would. To disregard a priest of the path was a capital crime, and only a fool would risk such a punishment. No, to reveal myself as a priest would not only mean to rely on the authority of others, but also to return to my false life. I already felt my stomach constricting warningly. I had to comply, so I took a deep breath and swallowed my feverent shame. Ignoring the mocking glances of the buccaneers, I silently gave the barmaid a sign that I wanted a room for the night. I had no desire for a meal any more, even less in the presence of those who had witnessed my humiliation. The barmaid nodded pitifully and stood and told an old man who sat quietly at the counter and looked undefinably at me to show me the way. In silence, I followed the old man up to the room. Only when I stood in front of the room's door, I felt the malice of the brutes, which cut like a sword in my back, began to wane. I gave the old man five pennies and hand he handed me the key, a burning candle and a cloth for cleaning, which was probably meant as a benevolent gesture, but only intensified my shame. I turned around silently, entered my chamber and locked the door behind me. Anger overcame me like a flood. Without taking notice of the bed, I moved to the window and stared into the rain. I let out a suppressed shout, closed my eyes and clawed both my hands into the window ledge. By the black guardian, I was angry. Of course, the rational part of me knew that I had gotten off cheaply. In other seedy taverns, people left a brawl with a broken arm or worse. However, I was unwilling to accept the events and put them aside. Did these men have no respect? This kind of scum deserved to be hanged, flayed and skinned like brigands and marauders preferably in public. My jaw cramped and I be became aware of the feeling in my stomach starting to change. The dull twang of insecurity had transformed into flaming rage, encaged in iron determination. I will not begin my new life in disgrace. I opened my eyes and looked at the candle the innkeeper had given me. The flame spluttered, sputtered and flickered and in a strange way its fire strengthened my determination. I wanted to teach the two apes a lesson, even if it was the last thing I did, but how? What can I do except preaching, reading books and mixing herbs? I stilled. Yes, now I was almost grateful that the two disrespectful primitives had crossed my path right here and now. 
A malicious grin bloomed on my lips as I turned my gaze back to the window. For a short time, I marvelled at the man staring at me from the silent glass. His pale blue eyes were like burning ice, a contradiction that seemed to be as natural to him as the fire of the sun in autumn twilight. He no longer resembled the cringing priest who had given the blessing to washerwomen only a week ago. Yes, the man admitted something aching to power, determination, fire.